All right, kids, here we go. So I've actually been getting a lot of really nice comments from people that have actually been responding about the broadcast tutorials that I have actually been providing for television. Because there's a lot of different minutiae and crap that can be extremely confusing and, in my opinion, does not really get a whole lot of love and coverage on YouTube or, really, to be honest, any other reference material. Now, those of you that know me know that I've actually been working in broadcast television for close to 15, 20 years now, closer to 20 at this point. I started really early on. I actually started when I was uh, 16 years old at my local TV station. So I'll let you do the math as to how old you think I am, and you're probably not that far off, although I'm told I don't look it. But uh, this is actually really nice because now that we kind of live in a digital world, you get a lot of this information that if you're just doing something for YouTube, it doesn't really necessarily have relevance until you are in a position where you actually have to produce something for television. And the problem is, is television, or not a problem, depending on how you look at it, if you're not used to the way things are for broadcast, it's going to be very confusing. And television is going to be here for the foreseeable future, at least another 10, 15 years, I would think. And as I always say, YouTube stars, you ever notice that when they get offered a big TV deal with NBC or ABC or CBS or any of these big networks, they never ever say no. So that's something that uh, I think is important to keep in mind. And that is why these videos are important because, you know, we have a new world of content creators out now and there will be occasions where it has to be done for television and there is a way that things need to be done. So the comment that I'm actually going to cover tonight is actually in relation somewhat to one of the tutorial videos that I did on how to do a 3-2 uh, pull down for broadcast, which is related to multi-channel audio, which I've also done a tutorial on. And this is actually a very interesting question, and I'm just going to actually pull it up here because it's one that I get a lot. And this actually comes from Adam Bankhead, and Adam says, subscribed. Maybe now do a video on audio levels required on some of these broadcast specification sheets. I'm supposed to upload a file, 30 second commercial, with an average decibel of minus 20, which sounds totally absurd to me. No one will be able to hear it. Cheers and thanks again. And this I thought was particularly interesting because it is actually something that comes up fairly often. And if I can put this bloody thing back so it's not in the freaking way, then I can look back at the camera. So this is actually a, a very interesting question, and this was in relation, he actually sent me a very nice message thanking me uh, for I think it was the pull-down video that I'd done, which a lot of people don't know about. It's a way to convert 24 frames or 23.976 smoothly to 29.97. So in relation to the minus 20, and you can see it in the comment stream on that video, I'll post the link below. So what's interesting about minus 20 decibels is he's very right. It is an extremely quiet volume, basically. And he is right that most broadcasters want, generally in the corridor, uh, depending on the broadcaster, between minus 18 and minus 24 dB, averaging out at minus 20. And I apologize, uh, Tilk is... Uh, providing commentary at the background because I am actually not in my studio right now. I am actually at home, which is where I do my live streams and it uh, allows me to be a little, let my hair down a little bit. Not that I have much hair. I just had my hair cut and it's quite short. So going back to minus 20, yes, it is extremely quiet. And for those that don't really know the reason, and a lot of people don't, it is a little confusing, particularly because in a lot of countries, commercials are louder. But that is actually a recent development, and that has actually been excised in the United States. So I'm just going to go a little bit into the history of why that is the case. And I'm actually going to put markers in the video so that you can kind of bypass the theoretical crap and just go on to how to fix the damn thing when you're trying to get something for broadcast so that it doesn't get rejected by quality control or QC at the station that you're providing your master to for being too loud or too low or not averaging out. So this video is going to be a little longer. Um, so 
I would recommend that if you have more time, and I always say this in my videos, if you have more time, I would strongly recommend that you stay for the whole thing because even though you don't necessarily need to know why minus 20 is the way it is and the history is not directly required in order to understand or not to understand, to be able to do it so that QC doesn't fail, it always is helpful to understand why things work the way they work so that you have more context as to why things work the way they work. And this is, uh, I think, is extremely important. A lot of people don't. Some disagree with me. Some agree. It's up to you. But if you have the time, I would strongly recommend that you sit and you watch the, the whole thing. So first of all, I'm just going to go into, as I say, I'm going to go into why minus 20 decibels is the case that it is. And more to the point, I'm going to go and explain how you can set up your video, or sorry, so how you can set up your audio so that it doesn't do that. And as I say, I will actually put stuff in the links below. I will actually put comments below so that you can see sort of how it works. So minus 20 decibels being the reference tone for audio. Why is it minus 20 decibels and what exactly does that mean? Well, thanks to the handy dandy geniuses that have brought us what is called the SMPTE, that's kind of the standard bars and tone that everybody knows. So when you kind of, if those of you that were basically old enough to kind of hear that dee at the beginning or the end of the night, uh, back in the days when television stations used to sign off, you would know what this is. But it's basically, it's those colored tone, it's basically those colored bars that you see on your screen. They're sort of rainbow bars. And then there's this really annoying high-pitched beep that's a, an incessant solid tone. Now, this is known as SMPTE tone. Now, you might be wondering, what the hell is that and what is it for? Well, when it's at the beginning of a master, be it a commercial or a television show or any piece of content that is going to be airing for broadcast, what that bar, that set of colored bars and the noise indicate is it actually is kind of a measuring stick for the television station to basically know how the colors are supposed to display and how loud your program should be. So it's basically a measuring stick to tell the TV station, hey, this is how loud the show audio is supposed to be, and here's how the colors are supposed to be relative to these colored bars. So on every piece of broadcast equipment, those bars display the same way. So if you have a vector scope or a waveform monitor hooked up to it, those values have a universally accepted standard that those colors must appear this way and that the audio must sound that particular way in terms of volume. And SMPTE is being a universal standard as long as every single TV station that uses that standard, it's exactly the same by listening to your program audio after it. They then compare the audio for the program that you've supplied to the annoying beep in the SMPTE tone and the colored bars. This is a long-winded way of saying that this is used to make sure that basically your show presents the way you want it to, to make sure that it's at the volume you want it to and make sure that the colors aren't all screwed up. Because as we all know, anybody, of, any of us that have ever had our own TV, which is pretty much everybody, every TV displays a little bit differently out of a box. So, and that goes all the way back to the CRT tube days to now, right? You might have a Samsung TV or an RCA or a Sony or some weird TV from some no-name company from overseas. They're all going to display colors a little bit differently. And so the SMPTE standard allows for a universal standard so that no matter what your TV is on, as long as it's within that set of parameters, it'll display properly. So that's basically what that is. It's a way to kind of bring together all these different TVs in a way that you know that even though it displays a little differently on each TV, it will at least display correctly within a certain tolerance and parameters. 
So that's why we have those bars and tone. Now, again, that brings us back to our original question. Why is it minus 20 dB? Well, to answer that question, we actually need to go way back to the late 1930s uh, in the case of Europe and the late 1940s, early 1950s in terms of North America. Now, what does a digital signal have to do with television now? Well, the reason is, is even though when you watch TV with rabbit ears or just your regular TV, even though the signal that you're getting is digital, it's actually being carried over old school analog transmitters or repeaters. So it's actually using very old infrastructure, that is if you're not using a cable box, in order to get the signal. And the reason for this is the infrastructure is very, very old. All these repeaters and transmitters that existed in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s were set up in such a way they were designed to push analog over-the-air television. And just like digital, there is bandwidth. Now, when everything was switched over to digital, they actually had to find a way to take a digital signal and compress it in such a way that it could actually be transmitted over the air with existing old 40s, 50s television transmitter towers and repeaters that push the signal further. So this is really very much the same way for those of you that follow the 8-bit guy or LGR and those sorts of channels that deal with retro technology. Those of you that are old enough like me that might have had a Commodore 64 or a VIC-20 or something like that in the 80s, and this is covered very well, but uh, back in the 80s, there were a couple of ways that you could get programs on your computer. And some of us fancy kids, which I was not one of, had floppy disks, and then the rest of us that weren't quite so fancy schmancy, we actually had a cassette deck. So you could actually get programs on an old school cassette deck and then it would actually be connected to your computer. Now, you could actually listen to a Commodore program on a tape and it just sounded like a bunch of garbled nonsense. In fact, it sounded a little bit like this. Now that is actually what computer code sounds like. Now, you might ask what exactly this has to do with television. Well, you're actually listening to what a digital program sounds like. So if you had a Commodore 64 or VIC-20, and this was what your program sounded like, your computer would actually listen for those sounds. And it is then in turn able to basically take that code, those sounds, and it understands it, and it's able to compile it into code which the computer understands and is able to run a program. So when television moved over to digital, they basically did the same thing, right? Because it doesn't make sense. It's too expensive to take 50 or 75 years of, of millions or billions of dollars of infrastructure and completely junk it when you have a perfectly reliable way to push a signal that is already set up to go coast to coast. So this is basically what they did with television. What they did is they took analog transmitters and they found a way to basically take the signal, take a digital signal in a way that could be pushed in an analog way. And then by the time your TV gets it, it's able to decode it. Works exactly the same way in theory, not in terms of practice, but it's the same idea as when you had a cassette of a Commodore program. In fact, in the 80s, they actually used to have radio stations uh, particularly at universities. They did where I grew up in Ottawa. And you could actually set your tape deck to record these programs that would broadcast on the radio. And then you'd go to sleep and then you'd wake up in the morning and you'd have basically shareware. It was like the first shareware. And you basically would wake up. It's like, hey, I got a new video game. This is great. And the television signal kind of works the same way. So we're going to go way back to the late 19, uh, 1930s and early 1940s in the case of Europe. And as I say, the late 1940s, early 1950s in the case of North America, so the United States and Canada. 
So Europe actually had a well-established television service long before North America did, uh, long before the United States. Well, not that long before, but about 10 years before. 10 years before the United States and uh, a little bit more than that for Canada. Canada was a little further behind. We didn't actually get our first television service until 1952, whereas in the United States, their television service was fairly well established by the late 1940s. So in order to understand this minus 20 dB audio and various other things in terms of why television is sort of set up the way it is, we first need to understand how the analog system works. So if we go back to England and Europe in general, so there's two distinct systems then as now. These two systems are still used today. I'm not going to go into CCAM because I'm just basically trying to simplify the process here. So in England, they England and a large part of Europe, they use the PAL system. Now the way the PAL system works, the way it worked in an analog fashion, is now you got to understand that Europe is a lot smaller in terms of land area than North America. And what that means is that when you set up a transmitter to push a signal, you don't actually have to make as many of them. And they also don't have to be as, they don't actually have to be as far apart. Because basically England is an island and Europe is not super huge overall. So for that reason, you don't actually have to have as many transmitters or so in order to push that signal. And so PAL works in a different way than NTSC, which I, I'm going to go into in a minute. Now, the way PAL works, uh, particularly in an analog fashion, is the way the British televisions worked and the PAL systems in general is your transmitters and your repeaters that would actually push, keep boosting the television signal so the entire country could get it, is that you would actually have three different colors, three different color channels that would actually be transmitted. So because the country and the continent wasn't really all that big, you could actually afford to take a separate red channel, a separate green channel, and a separate blue channel and actually separate them. So they actually have their own distinct wavelength and you can push those over the air. And what would happen would be is that the TV at the end would actually be able to see the individual red cable or the individual red channel, the individual blue channel, and the individual green channel. And that, it would actually be combined in the television set itself. So what that meant is you could have a much purer signal, right? Because the country wasn't that big in terms of land area. So you could afford to have three separate high quality uninterrupted streams. In this case, the red, the green, and the blue. Consequently, those of you that were around in England at the time, up until the digital switchover, and maybe spent some time in North America, would notice that the colors were quite a bit more intense than you would see on North American television. And I can speak to this because my family uh, much of my family lives in England, and my grandparents are from England, and my aunts and uncles are from England, and my brother and I don't have English accents, but push comes to shove, the rest of my family does. So I, I grew up in, in both of these uh, worlds. So PAL has very, very strong colors. Now, that signal requires a fair amount of bandwidth, which is not that big of a deal in a country the size of England and a lot of European countries because, frankly, Europe overall, in terms of land area, is not that big. It's smaller than the average state. So, consequently, you can actually take a signal and you can push it quite far. So, that's sort of how PAL works. Now, I'm going to go on to NTSC. In terms of NTSC, it's a little bit different because NTSC is a North American standard. So the North American system works a little bit differently. It also pushes a color signal through. But unlike PAL, where you have a separate red, green, and blue signal that is effectively 
beamed in a pure fashion to the TV, where it's looking for those three individual streams, NTSC works as what's known as a composite signal. So instead of having a straight green, blue, and red signal, that information is actually compressed into a its own signal. And then the TV kind of decodes it, so to speak, at the end. And the reason that the NTSC standard is a little bit different and the color isn't quite as nice as PAL is because of, well, there, there's a couple of different reasons for this. The main reason is when you have individual colors like that, red, green, blue, they use a lot of bandwidth. And Canada is really big in terms of landmass, and so is the United States. So if you figure, that a transmit or a repeater. So let's just kind of go into the way television programs are pushed out. So at the television station, or if that might be pushed by a microwave to the television transmitter, the transmitter is actually the main master point, which you can see here. And the master transmitter is only able to push the signal so far until the signal starts to weaken and dissipate right because there's things in the way there's just there's things that the signal can bounce off of and the more something bounces off of it it will eventually dissipate and go away so what happens is is approximately every 20 or 30 miles or 50 kilometers or so if you prefer there is what is called a repeater so any of you that have ever driven you know in the country or in an area you'll notice that every 20 or 30 miles you'll actually see a television tower it's called the repeater and it looks a little bit like a crazy power line with all these things coming off it looks like a giant radio tower with with spires so the next time you're driving take a good look because if you're driving in particularly in america or canada you'll actually see one of these every 20 or 30 miles or so and basically what that is is it's kind of like a battery booster it recharges the signal so that it can go to the next repeater and the next repeater and the next repeater. And the idea about this is that the master transmitter actually sends the signal to another repeater and the repeater basically repeats the signal to another repeater. And the idea is that as long as there's one of these guys every 30 miles or so, no matter where you are in the country, then chances are you're going to live within 30 miles of one of these repeaters. And that is how your TV gets that signal. Now, because North America is a lot bigger in terms of land area, that's a lot of bandwidth that has to be pushed. And because of that, you can't actually, the PAL system is actually not that efficient because it has a pure signal. It needs more juice. So that works well in a country like England or in France or a lot of places in Europe where the land mass isn't that big. So you don't need to have a huge amount of these transmitters, right, in order to reach the entire country. But in a country like the United States or Canada, where, you know, you're talking two, 3,000 miles from one end to the other, that's a lot bigger. So the cost to have a repeater every 20 or 30 miles is, the cost is unreal. So what do you do? You only have so much money, and you have to make sure that everybody in the country is able to get a television signal. Well, the way you do that is you find a way to basically take your broadcast signal and make it more efficient. In other words, compress it. So this is basically the old school analog 50s way of, say, H.264 and MP3, where you basically compress, just like you would take a video. You're not going to take a quick time animation file and put that on YouTube. It's insane. It's compressed. So you would compress it to a format like H.264 or, or you know, WMA or or WMV or whatever. You're going to compress it to a smaller format that still looks pretty good, but is nowhere near as big. And that actually kind of started with television, television and radio, right? So 
the engineers figured, okay, well, PAL has a wonderful television quality, and we can get a much higher quality signal. And by the way, this goes back to black and white, because I'm sure some of you are going, hey, 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 yeah, I got you. You've been talking about color, but ah, this goes back to the days of black and white and color uh, didn't come until later. Uh, you know, I'll sure show you. Well, actually, no. The thing is, is even though color, I'm using color as a no pun intended analog here, but the quality of the PAL signal was still quite a bit higher than the NTSC signal. It just meant that when color came along, they worked out how much bandwidth that they had to get the color signal that they needed. So the quality of the British television signal was quite a bit higher in the 19, late 1940s and early 1950s than the North American signal because you're still using the equivalent of PAL where you have a lot more resolution. You just don't actually have color information that you're pushing yet. On the flip side, it also means that you have a lot more quality information that you can push because you're not actually dealing with colors. You're just dealing with luminance basically the brightness of something. You don't have to worry about chroma yet. So even back in the black and white days, television still had a higher quality image in a European signal than a North American signal because you still had more bandwidth to deal with. You just weren't dealing with color yet. And that's why that is set up that way. So when color came along, they realized that with PAL, hey, in Europe, hey, we've got room for a separate red, green, and blue signal, and this will give us a nice pure color. And there aren't as many repeaters, so you can actually have this go quite a bit longer, which is not too shabby. Conversely, when they had to adapt the idea of color television for North America, they realized, well, okay, we have so many repeaters, but we can't take a color signal as pure as the PAL one, where there's a separate stream for every color, we're going to have to find a way to combine these colors into a signal that we can actually efficiently get to people without basically having the whole thing come down like a stack of cards or a house of cards. And so basically, it all comes down to compression. The NTSC and the PAL standard for analog broadcast really comes down to how much ice cream can you fit down a straw? Because even when you're broadcasting a signal, it's just like trying to force a milkshake through a straw that's too small. If you have too much information that you're trying to shove down too small a gullet, there's no way that that information can efficiently get through. So you need to find a way to compromise. And that's it's basically the analog form of buffering. A video buffering. That's in a way it was kind of the first sort of video buffer. Now, you might ask, what the hell does all this fancy crap from long before I was around or doing this or whatever have to do with minus 20 degrees or minus 20 decibels? Well, compression and making sure that you can maximize your signal goes far beyond just the video. The audio for sound also actually has to go down that same pipe. And it's going to use bandwidth too. might not be digital bandwidth, but it's still going to be bandwidth. right? Because remember, both in Europe and in North America, whether you were doing PAL or NTSC, you still have to find a way to get audio alongside the video signal. right? Because you obviously, if you have a television program, People need to hear you. It's not like silent movies. By the time television came out, people were expecting to actually be able to hear crap that was coming from the TV. So that's a fair amount of information that needs to fit in a signal. You have to have a decent quality, either black and white or color sound signal, or sorry, color or black and white video signal. And you also need to be able to find a way to get the sound in that signal as well. So that's a pretty tall order. That's a lot of information that you have to be able to cram. And remember, you need to be able to cram this coming from the television station and be able to go at least 20 or 30 miles and then be boosted without any signal loss to another repeater every 20 or 30 miles. 
so that everybody that has a TV can actually see the damn program. So right now, I, so I started with, well, I started with color, but basically black and white is what it started. And then when color came out, they had to find a way to figure out how to push a color signal through the black and white infrastructure. And they found a way to do it. They always find a way to adapt. Because remember, this is basically like setting up telephone poles. This is a huge undertaking that was already set up over many, many years. So you have all this infrastructure. You can't just dig it up and, and throw it away. They tried to find a way to use the infrastructure, which in this case were the transmitters and the repeaters, in order to push that signal. So too, when we moved from analog television to digital, not everybody has cable. There had to be a way to get the signal from rabbit ears. And those of you that might remember the 2008, 2009, or whatever, when the big switchover came over, uh, came about, and the analog signal no longer worked, they said, oh, you have to go and get an ATSC box or buy, yeah, either have to buy a special TV in order to, that had a tuner, an ATSC tuner in it, or you had to buy a little 30 or $40 box that was a tuner that you would hook up to the RF or the, you know, or the RCA at the back of your TV or your VCR so that you could keep getting over the air. This is basically a digital tuner. Uh, in simpler terms, it was basically the new version of rabbit ears, right? Because they knew that people weren't necessarily going to go out or be able to afford to buy all new TV because they were shutting off the analog signal. It was all digital but it's still actually using an analog infrastructure. And basically what they did is kind of the same deal. So r just like they took color and found a way to make it work with the existing infrastructure of transmitters and repeaters every 20 or 30 miles, they found a way to use those same transmitters and repeaters to send a digital signal. And just like analog, that uses bandwidth. So you still need to take a signal and find a way to push it. So although the analog system was, well, analog, the way that the digital system worked works a little bit like the Commodore 64 program tapes. You can still take noise and information and gobbledygook and transmit in an analog way. It just means that you have to have a little decoder box at the end to be able to make sense of the signal and unscramble it basically in a way that the television understands, which is actually brilliant from an engineering point of view. So instead of having to tear up all those transmitters and all those things that were set up for the old days of television, they actually found a way to take a digital clean signal in order to make that existing infrastructure work. So they basically found a way to piggyback digital television on an analog carrier, which is actually really cool. Now, this all comes back to that compromise. And don't worry, I am actually getting to the minus 20 decibels in terms of broadcast audio. Now, what's interesting about broadcast audio is it also kind of deals with those limitations. Because even though you might have a repeater every 20 or 30 miles, the amount of bandwidth that you have in order to transmit is finite. So they actually had to come up with a way to take that digital signal where they could put the video and the audio in that one signal and reliably go across the country that you could get. And unlike analog, where if you had kind of a weak signal, it would be kind of fuzzy and the picture might be kind of crappy, but you could still at least see in the case of digital, it absolutely needed to be able to be unscrambled at the end. You couldn't have a partial signal with digital television. You either get garbled mess or nothing or the full signal. So they really had to be even more careful about how to take that signal and make sure that it could be re reliably pushed across the country using a, a effectively a 50, 75-year-old system of transmission, being all these repeaters. And this is where the same idea of limitations comes in. So without going too far into the math and all the engineering gobbledygook, basically bandwidth 
comes down to the following. And anybody that's ever tried to master a vinyl record can tell you this. The more bass you have when you're cutting a vinyl record, like an audio record, you're actually going to use up more of the groove. There are certain types of signals that eat up more bandwidth. So you actually have to find a way to kind of balance everything so that you're using just enough of the bandwidth that everything's balanced out and it looks good enough for transmission, but not so much that you're hogging resources away. So you can't have too much of a signal in terms of your video where you don't have enough room for the audio so that you can't hear it or it sounds like crap, or where you have something that sounds like crap, or sounds really good, sorry, uh, but the video quality's crap. So they actually had to come up with a digital signal that had just enough information and was compressed just enough that they could push that signal. And just like analog, there are certain things that you have to do. Certain colors, certain compression algorithms, certain things will use more bandwidth. And it's the same deal with audio. In some cases, the lighter and more dynamic the mix that you have, the more bandwidth you're actually going to use up. And this is why MPEG compression, going all the way up to H.264 and H.265, that's why if you try to compress a video, for example, where the tripod is locked off and the background isn't moving and it's just a person talking, it only actually has to update the pixels that actually change. So if the camera's not moving and just a person's head is moving a little bit and their mouth is, whereas, and then you compress it, you're actually going to get a much smaller file then if you have a, uh, a shot where the camera's moving all the time and in the exact same codec, same H.264 with the same compression settings because it updates the pixels that it sees changing. That's how it works. It, it only changes the information that it sees as changing. So if most of the pixels are the same, then it doesn't need to update those pixels and therefore needs less space. And that's how the MPEG compression works. It's the same deal to some degree with audio. The louder and more dynamic the signal and the more up and down that you have. I mean, I'm oversimplifying this, but I'm just giving you kind of a general idea here. In a signal like that, the more up and down and, and dynamics that you're going to get in an audio signal, the more bandwidth it's going to use up. And so the engineers, the broadcast engineers and the sound engineers had to come up with a way that no matter what kind of television program or movie was being broadcast, that no matter what, it would reliably transmit so that you could hear it and it didn't sound like complete and total garbage. One of the ways to reduce the bandwidth was to lower the volume and normalize it. So basically a whole lot of studies and all this stuff was done, and they effectively found that minus 20 decibels was an ideal volume. It's very quiet. Well, why would you have something very quiet? Well, I'll get into that in a, in a minute. But basically, a quiet signal uses less bandwidth. So although minus 20 might sound really quiet to you, Remember, the TV has things in it, and your receiver has things in it that can take that signal and boost it. There's no sense having a louder signal broadcast that way when it can actually be boosted by the time it gets to your TV or your phone or whatever, or whatever it is that you're using that's decoding that signal. So the solution for having enough bandwidth, no matter, because remember, no matter what kind of program, doesn't matter if you're watching Star Wars where there's lots of explosions and dynamic stuff or a classical music concert where you have a lot of up and down and different volume and dynamic range, that all has to fit within that headroom. So minus 20 decibels is sort of the magic volume that no matter what kind of program that you have, you can fit everything in it and still have enough room for the picture, knowing that once it reaches your TV, the volume can actually be raised and you can hear it. 
right? You don't actually need, it's, it's a form of working smarter. You don't actually have to have the audio louder in the actual signal path when it's being sent to your TV when you can have the TV turn it up for you, right? Why use up bandwidth if you don't have to? And that's why. And this is also why we normalize signals. And this is also why when you send something to QC, they actually give you an aggregate. So it gives you a range that it'll accept. And as a general rule, it can differ from broadcaster to broadcaster. But generally speaking, it's about four decibels. And I'll tell you why that is. For the minus 20 decibel signal to work, it can't be too dynamic because if the frequencies are too high or too low below a threshold, they'll actually be cut off. So this is why there's actually a threshold of a few decibels that you have to stay within. And then the QC ingest actually looks at the overall of your waveform and then determines what frequencies are above and below that threshold because anything above or below is actually going to get cut off. So that's actually why that happens that way. And so this is why, although it seems extremely anal, that when you have to provide your audio at minus 20 dB to a television station with no more than a 4 decibel difference between everything within that, that's why. The reason that that is there is because it is a normalization range to ensure that everything can be heard and that nothing you want in your signal is cut off. And that's why that's the case. It's just to make sure that no matter what TV show or what programming that you're providing, that everything that you're putting in that signal, you can be sure that the person on the other end watching your show or your commercial or whatever on TV, that they're actually hearing things the way you intended to be heard and that nothing is being cut off and that nothing is too quiet or too loud or you're getting noise or anything like that. It's basically a catch-all frequency to make sure that no matter what you put in there, it's never going to get cut off because the TV can always boost the volume at the end or lower it. But by making sure that you have just enough juice in that signal that you can put that in there, then it doesn't matter what you put in there because there's always going to be room. And that's why minus 20 dB is the default. And that's why stations, although they may seem like they're being extremely anal, they're actually doing you a huge favor. Because as long as you do that, no matter what you provide, it'll just work. And that's why. Because your digital signal is actually going across an analog path. And there are compromises that need to be made with that infrastructure to make sure that all that different type of programming displays and is heard properly when Joe Public is sitting and watching your crap on TV. And that's why that is. So that's the end of the history lesson. So hopefully that helped a little bit. Now we're actually going to go into. Well, this is all well and good, but how do I get the damn thing so that it's minus 20 and that I don't get it sent back and rejected by the television stations? Well, don't you worry about that. I'm going to show you how to do that right now.